The last section deals with God and government. What is the government's role in society, God-given role? What is a citizen's role beneath that government and God's authority? That's what this chapter deals with. So we've already talked about God's left hand and right hand work. The left hand work of God has everything to do with his continued work for provision and justice for his creatures. Families provide and care for their family members. They bring order and protection to their household. Well, that is the role of the government on a larger scale for all society. Not as much that first part, provision, daily bread in the form of shelter and food and work, but more so that second part, justice. Without a government that has things like an army that protects us from foreign invaders who would do us harm, without um, policing that protects us from, you know, inside criminals in our nation who would, instead of being a you know productive member of society, instead they would abuse and manipulate their neighbors for their own selfish advantage. The government's job is to address those things. The government's job is to uphold justice through good laws and proper order and rule. Right? It's especially important for the weak and underprivileged. Right? Imagine living in a world where it's just the strong get what they want and the weak get abused. I don't want to live in that world. And God doesn't want you to live in that world either. God institutes governing authorities so that we won't live in that kind of world, so that governing authorities would reward those who do good and punish those who do evil. They're there to keep criminals in check. God has established governments for the benefit of all people. And before we move on, let's look at where the Bible teaches this. The chief passage is probably Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let's read this together. Paul writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the governing authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So what do we learn from this passage? We learn that we are to be subject to the governing authorities because God institutes every governing authority. The governing authorities are there by God's institution, and if you resist it, you're resisting God. Right? The governing authority is not there to terrorize good conduct. It is there to deter bad conduct. If you don't want to fear the government, then just do what is good. God institutes the government, establishes the government for your good. The government is God's servant for your good. It is to reward good, but the government is also to punish wrong. God has given the government the sword, not for no reason, not in vain, but for the purpose of also being his avenger who carries out his wrath, God's wrath, on the wrongdoer. So the government has been authorized to use violence for the selective purpose of punishing wrongdoing, right? Punishing law-breaking that harms neighbor, right? So the extreme version of this would be capital punishment, the death penalty. An obvious lesser versions of this would be fines, right? For dangerous law-breaking behavior, right? We are to be subject in subjection to governing authorities. They are God's servants for our good. They're also God's punishers, avengers of those who would do wrong. We're to pay taxes to the governing authority, revenue, respect, honor, each to whom it is owed. So that's what Paul teaches in this passage. Now, the first government that you have in Israel was a genuine theocracy, God rule, right? Theos for God, so theocracy. And he appointed their first king, Saul, and then later David, right? He appointed their prophets and their priests. 
Ancient biblical Israel is the only theocracy in world history. No other nation can call themselves God's nation in the way that Israel could. Because of that, that kind of unique combination of God's left-hand work and right-hand work in Israel, where God appointed the governing authorities in Israel directly, and he also appointed the right-hand workers in Israel, right, the prophets, the priests, directly in a sense, that makes them a unique theocracy in world history. God appointed their rulers. God wrote their constitution. You can read it in Exodus, starting with the Ten Commandments in chapter 20, and then with more specific civil law and consequences for breaking that law in chapter 21 and onward. Right? So Israel is a unique theocracy in world history. But it's not just Israel that is a governing authority established by God. Every single governing authority is established by God. That's what Paul just said in Romans 13. Christians are commanded to obey governing authorities. Those in authority are God's servant for your good. Obey them. God has given them that authority. Now, this begs all kinds of questions. What about corrupt governments? What about governments that abuse their authority, not to be God's servants for our good, but to serve themselves for their own selfish good? Even that government is established by God. So we have to obey even wicked men in govern office. Wicked leaders in governing offices? The answer is yes, with caveats. And let's look at what the very specific caveat is. Actually, I guess that's in a couple slides, so we'll save it. So there are responsibilities of government, right? The responsibility of the government is chiefly justice. Provide a peaceful place to live. Protect citizens from hostile forces outside, from criminals inside. Punish wrongdoing. Don't let people get away with theft, murder, slander, and so on. The government does have the sword for a reason. It can impose capital punishment on those who murder, for example. The government's job is to wage war against outside forces if need arises. Hopefully need wouldn't arise, but in this fallen, broken world, it does. Jesus talks about signs of the end, including wars and rumors of wars. Well, it's governments who are authorized to wage war. War should be waged for protective purposes, not for offensive, abusive purposes. But when people do wage war for those sort of offensive, abusive purposes, then others need to wage war defensively against that to protect their citizens. Governments are to gather taxes to pay for their legitimate authorized services, right? Law enforcement, national security. They have to pay for these things somehow. That's why citizens are called by Paul in Romans 13 to pay taxes to whom taxes are owed. So, Citizens also have responsibilities. The government does its part. Law, order, provide peace, provide security, provide justice. The citizens have their part. Obey. Pay your taxes. Be a law-abiding citizen. Perhaps in a democracy like ours, be <clears throat> someone who votes responsibly, runs for office, holds office responsibly if you win, seeing yourself as a servant of God, for the people whom God has appointed you over. So Christians are to honor their governing authority, just like they'd honor their father and mother, respect them, pray for them, and so on. All right, now those caveat questions. What about governments that act unjustly and immorally? Do you have to obey a, obey a corrupt governor? What about governments that persecute Christians? Right? Do you still have to pay taxes to governments that persecute Christians? What about governments like the Nazis that carried out tremendous acts of evil? And they're one terrible example, but they're not the only example. All kinds of people have wickedly held governing authority throughout history. Are Christians or are citizens called to even obey those governments? The answer is yes, but there's a very strong and important caveat, and that is what? You should disobey the government if and only if, when and only when, their expectation, their command is that you break God's law. You sin against God's word. It is never right to sin, even if your government expects you to. We have a great Old Testament example in the book of Daniel, right? Where Daniel is a high governing authority, right? So high that other governing authorities are jealous of him. They get the king to pass this new foolish law to bow down and worship this statue of the king. Daniel breaks that law. He knows it would be idolatry to worship that statue of the king as if the king were God. Daniel will only worship and pray to the one true God, Yahweh. And he does that privately in his room, breaking this new wicked law. 
He gets caught breaking the new wicked law. He gets thrown in a lion's den for it. Now, if you know the story, you know God spares Daniel's life, closes the mouths of the lion. But Daniel broke his government law because there is a king above all kings. There is a law above the law, God. So you obey your, aunt, your father and mother. You obey the governing authority. You obey your teachers. You obey your coaches and so on. Unless the teacher or coach or mom or dad even or government tells you to do something that would break God's law. Well, then we answer to God first and foremost, and we obey him before we obey anyone else. We also get an example of this in the New Testament. When Peter and some of the others are preaching the good news of Christ, they get dragged before the local governing authorities in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin orders them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, and they refuse. They won't do it. Jesus ordered them to preach in his name. So Peter answers, we must obey God rather than men. You tell us not to preach. Jesus told us to preach. We're going to listen to Jesus, not you. Now, when you do disobey the governing authority in that very specific case, if and only if, when and only when the government is commanding you to sin against God, you have to be ready to pay the price for it. Governments tend to not like to be disobeyed, right? So if you disobey the government, rightly so, because you'd be breaking God's command. If you did obey them, you'll probably get punished for it, fined for it, and more wicked governments hurt for it, thrown in jail for it, even killed for it, like many martyrs have been in the early church and throughout history. The disciples were flogged in Acts 5.40 for their disobedience to that government in Jerusalem. What about a government that's involved in other immoral activities? So maybe they're not commanding that you sin, but maybe those in governing authority are just corrupt men and women. They're not using their governing authority as God's servants. They're using their governing authority as servants of themselves. Right? They, they accept bribes. They don't do justice and, and they get rich off of their own policies, things like that. Are we to obey such governments? Yeah, but we're also to do what we can to get people out of such offices. If you have corrupt people in office and you're blessed to live in a representative democracy like we do, let's vote for new representatives. Right? Let's find new men and women who would take that office seriously in a godly way as God's servants for our good and get the people out of office who are just serving themselves in a wicked way. Conclusion, the Christian is in the world, but the Christian's not of the world because Jesus' kingdom is not of the world. Our true citizenship is in heaven. But while we live in this world, amongst Christians and non-Christians alike, we are to be a blessing to the world and all its creatures, but especially our fellow human beings that we're in relationship with. Christians bless the world when they do the left-hand work of God well. Do your vocation well in whatever job you have. Right now you're a student, but whatever job you have later in life, do it well. And as you do it well in a way that serves your neighbor, you are doing God's left-hand work and you're providing for your neighbor. And you're providing for Christ, he says. Whatever you do for one of the least of these, my brothers, you do for me. And when we do God's right-hand work of bringing the good news of Jesus to our neighbor, being the salt and light of the world, we are an incredible blessing to the world because this world is perishing in sin, but believers in Jesus won't perish with it. So we bring the good news of Jesus and his salvation to the world. God wants the Christian to be a blessing to the world. God blesses Christians and non-Christians alike through marriages, families, through governments. Vocations of Christians can be a blessing to many people and bring glory to God. Continue to think about the vocations God has given you, the significant relationships he's placed you in and family in friendship, at school, the work he has set before you, tasks and responsibilities that are yours, from household chores to homework to a current job to a future career. See all of these things as vocations, opportunities to serve God by serving your neighbor and being a blessing to people in this world, being Christ's salt and light to the earth.